Welcome back, physics fans, University of Kansas Colloquium. Today we have Cater Murch from Washington University at St. Louis. Professor Murch uh, did his PhD in Berkeley in 2008. He was a postdoc in 2008 to 2014. Went to WashU in 2014 where he's an assistant professor. He has been honored with a Sloan Award and with the NSF Career Award. These are very prestigious things for people to get. Today he'll talk to us about information gain and loss uh, for a quantum Maxwell's demon. You be careful, it's near Halloween time. <laughs> no demons, okay? Oh, good demon-themed talk Mark. for Halloween. Thanks. Can you guys hear me okay there in the back? This is a good level of microphone. Uh, feel free to ask questions as I'm going along if you have something you're confused about or upset about or both. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, some research we've done thinking about thermodynamics and uh, quantum mechanics and how they fit together. And this is primarily work done uh, by my student, Mehdi Nagalu, who is just uh, finishing his PhD. And we have a couple theory collaborators, um, Eric Lutz and Alessandro Romito, over in Europe. What I tell my, um, let's see if I get this to advance my slides, yeah, students, is that thermodynamics, okay, it's a field of science. Uh, it's concerned with quantities like heat and work for macroscopic systems. <clears throat> it's in some sense the most human of scientific enterprises because it combines our innate laziness with our fascination with fire, asking how do you get fire to do work? And I'd say that thermodynamics is really at the crossroads of quantum information and quantum mechanics in that right now we're uh, at a time where we can start to harness quantum mechanics for certain advantages. So we have quantum advantages in metrology, and in computation, and simulation, communication. And so the question is, do these fit into thermodynamics in some interesting way? Is there a way that we can get, for example, quantum mechanics to do work for us? Okay. So that's the general theme of quantum thermodynamics. But because this is a cloakum, I want to start with a bit of history. Um, and start my story with this uh, character here, Leo Szilard, who is a Hungarian-born physicist who uh, spent a lot of his career working with Einstein, actually, and was one of the main architects of atomic weapons. He was the person who actually authored the letter that Einstein signed that went to Roosevelt saying, look, atomic weapons are something we could build if you want to start a Manhattan project. And I found a quote from Leo uh, describing some of those early experiments uh, this was when they'd done the first experiments showing that when, two when a uranium atom fissions, it produces extra neutrons, uh, thereby sort of showing the possibility of a chain reaction. So he says, we turned the switch, saw the flashes, watched for 10 minutes, and switched everything off and went home. And that night, I knew the world was headed for sorrow. So he went later in his career went on, after helping construct atomic weapons, to advocate against their use to kind of fight this thing that he created. But I want to talk about uh, Leo Szilard's um, PhD work, where he was battling a different kind of demon. Uh, that is uh, what we now think of as Maxwell's demon. And his work is most famously summed up in the so-called Szilard engine, which I'll describe to you now. So imagine you have a box uh, with one molecule in it zipping around. And the idea is we're going to insert a barrier into this box. And then we'll uh, measure what side of that barrier the molecule's on. And now knowing what side it's on, we can allow this, this uh, molecule to push on that piston and we can extract KT log 2 of work. Okay, so this uh, Zillard engine, I'm very hypothetical, but it appears to violate the second law of thermodynamics in that it allows us, we're extracting work from a single thermal reservoir. And Zillard pondered about this and he thought, well, you know, there has to be something going on with uh, the memory of whoever measures uh, what side of the barrier this molecule is on. And in order to make the thermodynamics work out and to not break any rules, uh, it has to correspond to some free energy cost to reset that, that, that memory. And so this was his uh, contribution. And this really anticipated uh, work that uh, what happened more in the 50s and 60s um, from, for example, Claude Shannon and uh, Ed Jaynes and Rolf Landauer, really formalizing the uh, connection between entropy and information and free energy and so forth. Uh, but if you look at this um, Zillard engine with any uh, seriousness, you'll realize there's all sorts of problems with this thought experiment, like most thought experiments. 
Um, and the first one is that you notice when we insert this barrier, we've compressed the gas to half its volume without doing any work. So not only are we violating the second law, we're violating the first law. And what's going on is we're just being really sloppy here. We're mixing sort of our ideal gas interpretation when we're extracting work from it with this idea of a single classical molecule. And so there's just kind of, we're being too, too, too sloppy. And so to sort of motivate the ideas of, of my talk, I was thinking we could take this a little more seriously um, and treat it like as an undergraduate quantum mechanics problem. That is, let's think about our uh, molecule in the box as a particle in an infinite square well. And as you may know, uh, this um, system has uh, energy levels that grow quadratically with the quantum number n. They're just like the vote modes on a violin string. And um, OK, so that's our description of a particle in a box. And if we're thinking of a particle at some high temperature, well, then it would be in some mixed mixture of these energy eigenstates okay, with appropriate weighting factors. Okay, so particles described in this way uh, for a particle in a box, quantum mechanically. Okay, so let's see what happens when we insert the barrier. So you can imagine, um, I'm going to take a little barrier and just stick it into the bottom of the box. And so I can think about how that perturbs the wave function as I make the barrier stronger and stronger. Okay, and so you can see that this barrier, it's going to push up the energy of the wave functions that are even with respect to the center of the well. But it won't affect the odd solutions because there's no overlap with the barrier. And so you can see it sort of shifts up those energy levels. And you can see the wave functions, I've just drawn them in very sloppily. You know, the even solutions are slightly perturbed. The odd ones are unaffected. Okay. So as you make the barrier taller and taller, this uh, is bringing the even solutions up to be um, degenerate with the solutions that are odd with respect to the center of the well. Until uh, we get to the point where the barrier is very deep and these two energy levels are pretty much the same. And you can see here that now the, uh, the, st the eigenstates of the system can be thought of as a symmetric combination of right and left well states and an anti-symmetric combination of right and left well states. That is, those are the new eigenstates of the system. So really, these, these, these states are this uh, superposition of left and right well states. So our description of our uh, thermal gas, uh, our, our single particle at some temperature, is now going to be a mixture of superpositions of right and left well states. Okay? Because this is how to describe this gas. So it's, so it's in you know, a bunch of these states, a mixed state, but it's a superposition states. And so what we can learn from this uh, simple thought experiment is that by, when you insert the barrier, the uh, molecule is not on one side or the other. It's actually in a superposition of being on both sides. Okay, so it's in both sides. So the, the barrier doesn't really do anything about putting the molecule on one side or the other. It's actually the measurement that, that forces the molecule, collapses it onto one side or the other. So already we see that the measurement process is actually doing more uh, than we thought in the classical sloppy treatment. Okay, so if you can compare them here, in the classical case, inserting the barrier compresses the gas, but the measurement reveals what side it's on. Inserting the barrier here does nothing. Well, it actually costs some, some work to insert it in because you're shifting energy levels up. And it's the measurement that collapses the molecule on the right and left side. Okay. So the idea here is we're going to think about quantum mechanics and we're going to ask what's the relationship between um, information and measurement and energy and ultimately get to an experiment that really susses out how these things are related. Okay. Um, but let me digress a bit and just think about how we talk about information. Okay. In uh, the Zillard engine, he realized the demon is violating the second law, and that's because he's cheating, in some sense, using the information to break the rules. So if you think about cheating, you might think about a game of cards. So let's say I had a simple uh, guessing game where I have a, a nicely shuffled deck of cards, and I want to guess what card's on the top of the deck. Okay, so the, for example, the probability that it's the two of clubs is 1 in 52. But if I had cheated, and while I was shuffling it, I glance at the bottom card, seeing that it's a jack of hearts, well, then that's going to improve my odds a bit. Okay, so now I know that the probability of the top card being two of clubs is one in 51. So I've gained some information, and the way we quantify that is with something called the mutual information. <clears throat> so the mutual information is uh, the difference between the uh, sort of the, the unconditioned entropy, log 52, and the uh, conditioned entropy, when we have sort of conditioned on this information we have here, and so it has to do with the difference of these two values. And that's how much information we got. So if you think about that um, in the case of Zillard's engine, well, 
And the unconditioned case, where we don't know what side it's on, here the, the entropy is just the sum of log of the probabilities times the probabilities, so that's log two. And then um, when we measure what side it's on, we see it's now zero. And so we have a mutual information of log two. And Zillard's you know, brilliance or something was uh, to say, okay, well that has to be, there's information, and we just multiply it by the appropriate units to save the second law and, and, and say that's a change in free energy. Okay, so he's thinking about this, this type of information. Okay, but what about if it's quantum information? That is, if we have some sort of situation where we're the, the superposition of it being on the right and left side. We know kind of exactly what state it's in, but it's still ambiguous what side it's on. How do we handle quantum superpositions and quantum information in this thermodynamic context? And you could ask, you know, how do you define work and how do you define heat and how do you define entropy when you in general have some sort of superposition of definite energy states? Um, and ultimately, are there advantages one can take from quantum superpositions and quantum entanglement? Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now let me tell you about the experiment. I talked about having a single uh, molecule in a box. We thought about it as infinite well states. Let's just focus on the possibility that the, the molecule occupies one of the two lowest energy states of the system. Okay, so we just focus on two energy levels. So we have two le energy levels. That's the same thing as a spin half in a magnetic field. It has two energy levels, spin up and spin down. So we'll think about it, in fact, as a pseudo spin half rather than particle in the box levels, but they're equivalent. And so let's just think about how measurement works for spin half. Okay, so this is coming right out of sort of intro physics, quantum physics uh, textbook. Um, so imagine we prepare this system in a spin up state so that's um, up in the z axis, what I call the ground state. Well, if it's in that state, we know that the expectation value of sigma z, the z component of the spin, is plus one. Okay, that's the state we prepared. And we also know the expectation value of sigma x, the x component of the spin, is zero. Okay, and let's say I go ahead and make it measure the x component of the spin. I find I get plus one. I find that actually it's up on the x-axis. Okay, well now we know that the expectation value of sigma x is plus one. But we also know that if the expectation value of sigma x is plus one, then the expectation value of sigma z is zero. So this simple example is already showing something kind of rich about quantum measurement. There's two things going on. On one hand, we change the expectation value of sigma x from zero to one. We reduced the uncertainty in sigma x by gaining information, but we paid a price. We changed the expectation by sigma z from one to zero. We sort of increased the uncertainty of sigma z, and that's some sort of what we call Heisenberg back action, sort of enforcing that, uh, this, that we don't break the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay, so that's a simple example of measurement, but I could make this more complicated. I could imagine sending my, uh, measuring the comp z component of the spin, then the x component, z, z, x, x, z, x. You can imagine sending this poor spin through some gauntlet of stern gerlach apparatuses, measuring the different components of the spin. And so each of those measurements gives me an eigenvalue, so it's plus one, minus one, minus one, and I can, as I'm getting those measurements, I update what the, my description of the state is in terms of expectation values, so it's, Expectation value sigma z goes from plus one to zero to minus one, so forth and so on, zero plus one in time. So over time, I see how the expectation values of this, for these poly operators is changing. Okay? So now let's make it one step more complicated. I can imagine applying any kind of general measurement, which I'll describe by some measurement operator M1. So I apply operator M1, I make another measurement, another measurement, another measurement, and I could describe my spin not necessarily in terms of the expectation values of poly operators, but instead as a, a density matrix. And so one component of the density matrix would evolve in time conditioned on the outcomes of all of these measurements. In this time evolution of the quantum state, say described by a density matrix, is what I call a quantum trajectory. Okay, so this is uh, going to be the key tool we have to understanding how information in quantum mechanics plays a role in how, did, how does a quantum Maxwell's demon extract information and do some sort of thing. This, this is how one measures something. Okay, so the idea behind a quantum Maxwell's demon is that the quantum Maxwell's demon is going to track these quantum trajectories. It's going to make a bunch of measurements, see how the state evolves in time, and at some time when things are looking good, the demon is going to extract work from the system. And we'll quantify that work and then learn something hopefully deep about the information that the demon had gained. 
Now there have been several experiments in the past, oh, I guess the oldest one here is 2009, past 10 years or so, um, exploring the idea of a Maxwell's demon type experiment at the level of a single energy quanta. So you've got experiments with uh, single photons, and single electrons, these are some sort of coll colloidal particles, uh, here's some single electron type things, here's some superconducting qubit experiments, similar to what we do. Um, but I think that these experiments don't quite meet my criteria of what I think of as a quantum Maxwell's demon. And the reason is, is because in all of these experiments, you can still think of the system as either occupying definite energy states, or if there were some coherences, the demon destroys those coherences with measurements. So the, the role of coherences uh, doesn't play any role in all these experiments. So that's what we're going to try to examine in this talk. Or to be maybe more precise, um, but can compare what I think between a classical demon and a quantum demon. A classical demon, okay, fine, it's a, it's a system with two energy levels, and there's a single quanta of energy. It might be a very small energy scale, has to operate at low temperature and so forth. But the demon thinks of it in terms of populations. There's just a probability that it's in this state or this state, and as such, because it's occupying some sort of definite state, the demon can measure it without any disturbance. Okay? And the demon might describe this with a density matrix, but it's always diagonal just populations. On the other hand, a quantum demon you know, took a quantum physics course and got to the point in the textbook where they said, ah, look, density matrix actually can have off-diagonal elements that have to do with coherences. So the quantum demon can keep track of those coherences and then has to understand that there's some sort of disturbance due to measurement, as we saw in the beginning of the talk. When we measured the x component of the spin, we changed the expectation value sigma z from 1 to 0. So you have to take into account that kind of disturbance. Um, which is you know, fundamentally related to entanglement in the measurement process and so forth. Okay, so the quantum demon is going to have to deal with this much more complicated system. Okay, so but one of the hurdles we face when thinking about quantum, um, or quantum systems that can in general be in some sort of superposition of definite energy states, so it's not in a definite energy state, is how do you talk about changes in energy? How do you talk about work when it's not definitely in one energy state, and at the end it's not in some de definite energy state. And the solution has been put forward by the community, of course there's lots of problems with this, but this is what people uh, feel comfortable with, is something called a two-projective measurement or two-point measurement protocol. The idea is that we'll make a projective measurement to project it onto a definite energy state, then we let the experiment go on, and at the end we'll make another projective measurement to project it onto an energy state. And so we know it started in this definite energy state and ended in this definite energy state, therefore the change in energy was exactly this much. Okay, so we're going to kind of circumvent the issues of talking about energy changes when you have superposition states by just making projective measurements. Okay, so here's how it works. We can say prepare it in some, um, in some initial state, so one of the energy states will later evolve and then later on we measure whether it's transitioned to the iron state, therefore increasing its energy by one quantum of energy or or not, no change in energy, and vice versa. From that, we can come up with a, a distribution of total energy changes, which is just the sort of transition probabilities times the initial prob uh, state occupation probabilities. Okay, so that's how we'll quantify the work the demon extracts is by just sandwiching whatever the demon does with these projective energy measurements. We can just see how much work the demon extracted. Okay, so here's the protocol uh, that we'll study. So we can start with our quantum system in some initial uh, thermal state, uh, some thermal equilibrium with our, our, our experimental apparatus. Um, a demon's going to make some quantum measurements on the system. At some point, the demon will extract work from that quantum system. In order to quantify that work, we're going to do projective measurements here at the beginning and at the end to see, ah, look, the demon got this much energy, the demon gave up this much energy, and so forth and so on. Uh, so before I get into the results, I want to take a break and talk a little bit about the superconducting qubit. That's our quantum system that we're studying. And then also a little bit more about these quantum trajectories, how it is the demon makes measurements on the quantum system. Then we'll come back to this protocol and see what happens. Okay, so our spin half system is not a particle, a molecule rattling around in some ball or con confined to the two lowest energy uh, eigenstates of some sort of p infinite potential well, but it's a something similar, it's a, something called a transmon circuit. So we take a Josephson junction, 
and we shunt it with the capacitor. So we have some sort of system that's described by uh, it's two energy scales, one associated with this Joseph's injunction and one associated with this, this capacitor. And long story short, this system has a potential energy landscape that's that of a cosine potential. Okay, and in fact, uh, one can solve analytically for the energy eigenstates of this potential, and you can see that they look kind of like harmonic oscillator states, but because it's a finite potential well, there's a low anharmonicity in that the spacing between these energy levels is not equal all the way up. Okay, so long story short, we'll just focus our attention again on the two lowest energy levels of this circuit, and that's our superconducting qubit. I'll just draw it like this, qubit, two levels, quantum levels. Now I'll mention that this, these sorts of superconducting uh, circuits are big business these days in terms of building a quantum computer and, and all sorts of quantum experiments. Uh, all sorts of research groups, in fact one here at KU, uh, studying how these circuits can be used for various quantum information uh, protocols to build quantum computers. So even companies such as Google and IBM are becoming involved. Um, something problem, problem with uh, ETH Zurich's experiments, they have ants that crawl around in their experiments, but they still do nice research, surprisingly. Uh, so there's lots of, lots of research in this area, and we're involved in some of that, but this is, this is sort of just thinking about it as a uh, um, simple quantum system we can study. Okay, so our system can, can, contains this qubit, and now in order to measure this, what we're going to do is we're going to couple that qubit to a single mode of the electromagnetic field, which is defined by a, uh, a microwave cavity. So we have some coupling, but dispersive coupling between the qubit and a cavity. What that looks like in reality is the qubit is some pattern chipped on a piece of silicon, and it's embedded in this microwave cavity. So I close this box up, and that's a waveguide cavity, has a volume with a certain uh, resonant frequency. Okay, I can uh, drive the qubit by sending microwave frequency drive resonant with this transition to induce Rabi of oscillations between these quantum states and change the Hamiltonian around and so forth. And I can also drive the cavity. Okay? And so the, by driving the cavity, I can measure something about the quantum state of the qubit. And here's how that works. This interaction here results in a qubit state dependent frequency shift of the cavity. So when I probe the cavity with this coherent state here, I get a qubit state dependent a phase shift on that coherent drive. Okay? So that may seem, sound kind of complicated, but I'll, I'll, I'll break it down in a second. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to then take this signal here, I'm going to demodulate it and digitize it, and I'll get some sort of measurement record. It's got noise on it, and the noise originates mostly due to the fact that there's a quantum uncertainty in the microwave light that I send in. Now this measurement uh, setup is so simple, I want to abstract away the the, all of the details of the experiment and show you kind of an almost offensively simple version of this experiment um, just to kind of give you real intuition about how the quantum measurement works. I think it's kind of uh, useful. So we can think about these two quantum states as two uh, shelves of a box. Okay, and this is a box, a ball that can sit on either the top shelf or the bottom shelf. Those correspond to two energy eigenstates. Okay, upper shelf, lower shelf, and there's my ball that dictates what quantum state it's in. And I'm going to imagine closing up this box which has these two shelves, and then I want to measure something about what shelf the, um, the ball is on. And I'll do that uh, in a very controlled way. So what I'll do is I'll cut a small hole in the side of the box, and I'm going to shine a laser through, because of course lasers are cool and that's how you do good measurements, and I'm going to measure what comes through on the detector, and use that to determine what state the, the ball is in. Is it on the top shelf or the bottom shelf? Okay, so that's my experiment. So first thing we'll do is we'll calibrate this experiment. So we'll start with the ball on the bottom shelf. And we'll, okay, but I should mention that we're going to do this uh, with lasers. And of course, if you turn the laser down, um, the, the fact that it's made out of individual photons starts to become important. So we're going to send in photons that get detected by the detector, which is maybe a single photon detector. Okay, so let's start by putting the ball on the bottom shelf. And we're going to shine the laser in, and we'll see what comes through. Okay, so what the detector says is in each integration time, say per second, we get three photons, two photons, one photon, one photon, five photons, four photons, zero photons. So first thing you notice is that the intensity detected by the detector is not perfectly steady. And this is a consequence of the fact that photons don't interact with each other. Um, and so they don't know to line up in a nice neat queue and they arrive at random times, leading to these fluctuations in intensity, which we know as shot noise. So it's due to the... Uh, this fundamental quantum fluctuations of light. Okay, but 
we have these varying different v scores here, different numbers of photons, and so we can make a histogram. And so on average, we've got three photons, and sometimes as few as zero, and sometimes as many as five. Okay, so let's do the same calibration now with the ball on the top shelf. And we see, okay, now we get five, four, two, one. So we on, a on average, we get five photons. Sometimes we get as many as eight, and sometimes we get as few as three. Question? Yeah, how many times do you need to do this to get a nice histogram? Oh, thousands and thousands of times. So maybe these are actually experimental histograms. I'll tell you exactly what the system is in the future based on tens of thousands of, of, of sort of measurement steps here. Okay? And of course, these are smooth histograms, not stepwise for different numbers of photons, and that'll also become clear. But you can imagine these are just, um, I could have, you know, on average, four and a half photons in, a, in some in interval of time, too. OK, so, that, so we now have calibrated the detector. So now let's get to the really fun question. Let's say I prepare uh, the system in a superposition of the two states. So it's a superposition of the top shelf and the bottom shelf. And because it's really it's this quantum circuit, and it's pretty easy to create these superpositions of two energy states. And now we want to measure what shelf it's on. OK? So Let's say we set this up and put it in the superposition. That's the way I draw it. It's like blue and red. And it's kind of in the middle, however I want to draw it. Um, and the detector makes a measurement, and uh, I get seven. So what do you think? Now, what does that, that measurement tell me? Is it more likely that it's on the top shelf given that measurement or the bottom shelf given that measurement? Top shelf. But why? It's common sense, right? It's more likely to be on the top shelf given that measurement because, uh, well, it's more likely to get uh, that value 7 if it was on the top shelf. And that sort of uh, logical inference actually has a fancy name. It's called Bayes' theorem. Yeah, it's Bayes' theorem for a classical system. For a classical system. Quantum. Yeah, that's Are true. Are get to something quantum? We'll get to something quantum, yes. Um, but the, have a question, though. Yeah. Why would you just hit it once? Why wouldn't you shoot the so we can turn to the thousand time, but the fact that we're, we're thinking about what happens, oh, the magic of this, I don't know if it's magic, it's physics or probably classical probability theory, is when we get seven, right, it's actually possible that we get seven and it was still on the bottom shelf. So we're not 100% certain that it's on the top shelf, but it's more likely it's on the top shelf than on the bottom shelf, okay? But and this, so This discussion, though, is using the probability of the hypothesis given the data the probably the data given the hypothesis. Yeah. Bayesian. Yeah. Wonderful if you really had a two step thing, but you don't have a two level system. You have all these superpositions. So that the discussion that it's either in the top or bottom, uh, of course, would be seen in 90 books, but it doesn't represent any experiment. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know you're working the superposition. Yeah. Uh, so you get a transition rate as a function of the superposition. Um, and all that. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go back to the, um, at some point I'll, I'm going to show you a proper measurement operator. And we can think about how it traces back to what the actual interaction is. Um, but I, I agree, and, and you should be upset, because this is a very classical argument. Um, and it's very, it's, I'm talking about what probability, you know, what's the probability is in this state or this state. But it turns out that this sort of simple Bayesian approach um, gets you exactly the right answer. So it saves you pages and pages of quantum optics theory and tracing over the various things um, in a sort of intuitive way. So it has some benefit, but it, maybe it irks the, the experts. Let's see. So Bayes' theorem, this is what we're using. Um, it says probability A given B, probability B given A, yada, yada, yada. Um, I didn't know much about it until I started doing this research, but I felt like this, um, this comic explains sort of the essence of Bayes' theorem pretty pretty well. So the question is, uh, here we are in this lecture hall. The windows are all closed. Uh, we could wonder if the sun just underwent a supernova in the last 30 seconds. Um, and there's no way to tell because we can't see the light coming from the detector. But the idea is that when the sun's burning, it's producing neutrinos. And those neutrinos interact so weakly with matter that they come right through the building during the day, and they come right through the Earth at night. And so and, you know, in reality, when the sun undergoes a supernova, there'll be a huge burst of neutrinos. And they would be detectable okay, with some sort of neutrino detector. And never mind the fact that the neutrino detector we have occupies a, kilomic, a, kilo, a cubic kilometer of ice in Antarctica. Uh, let's say it just is this big here. Okay, so, this, so we're going to ask the detector if a supernova 
has occurred. And the super detector uh, measures whether or not there's been this spike in uh, neutrinos due to the supernova. Um, but then, before telling us the answer, it rolls two dice. And if it gives us double sixes, gives it double sixes, it's going to lie to us, otherwise it tells the truth. Okay, so we press the button. Detector, did you go, did, was there supernova? And the detector says yes. Now this is tricky because the, uh, we have to analyze this with statistics because the detector could be telling the truth, could be, could be lying. How do we know what to believe? Okay, so we got to think about it with statistics. And standard approach statistics that you're taught, frequentist statistics, you think, okay, what's the probability that this happening by chance? It's the probability that you get double sixes. It's one in 36. That's a probability of about 2.7, 2.7%. That's a p-value less than 0.05. Therefore, we conclude that the sun has undergone a supernova. And the Bayesian statistician says, yeah, right. I'll bet you $50 hasn't. So the question is, what does Bayes' rule say about this situation? Well, the Bayes' rule says that the probability of a supernova given the yes answer is equal to the probability yes answer given a supernova. We know that, though. That's the probability that the detector is not lying to us. It's uh, 35 over 36, but 97 percent. Can we multiply that by the probability of a supernova during the course of this lecture, which is about zero? So um, zero times 97% is zero. So that's the that's Bayes' rule. Um, in this case of where we're thinking about um, whether it's on the top shelf or the bottom shelf, given n photons, well, we have, uh, so the top, probably the bottom shelf given n photons is equal to the probability of the bottom shelf to start with. That was a half. Uh, times the probability of n photons given the bottom shelf, and that's this given by this blue distribution here. Okay? Um, you know, divided by the probability of getting n photons. So we can use Bayes' rule to update our um, prob relative probabilities of being in the top shelf or the bottom shelf. So we're just learning about the diagonal components of the density matrix in this sort of state update. Okay, so uh, continue with analogy, you can imagine, um, I'm gonna just, here's my state, and I'll put, uh, just point an arrow to where it is. So if it's pointing to the side, that's the superposition top and bottom. Okay, along the x-axis, if you like. And then as I check photons, I'm going to update my state of knowledge. So if I get six photons, well, it's more likely to be on the top shelf. And then I detect zero photons, more likely to be on the bottom shelf. So each step of the way, I'm updating the state of knowledge about the, 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 um, the, the state of the, the ball uh, with Bayes' rule. Okay? Now, um, John made a good point. This is just about the, po the probability, the, the probability of it being in one definite state or the other definite state. So the thing we have to patch into this simple Bayes' rule al al uh, approach to calculating this is that uh, we're going to update the coherences to keep it on the surface of the block sphere. Okay? So if it starts off here, it goes up here, well, the x component stays, so it's not some uh, non-physical state. Or if it's up here and it goes in here, then that gets actually gets longer. And experimentally, we can actually confirm that that's exactly what happens. So, uh, as long as we sort of pat, patch um, heuristically in how the coherences evolve, this gives us a correct description of how the quantum state evolves. Why do you think it's a pure state? And of course, it's not exactly a pure state because it's a real experiment. And so there's some, it's close. but it's close to a pure state because it starts off in a pure state. And then I can do quantum state tomography at any point in time to determine where, what, real, what the, the components, the density matrix, so what the projection of spin is along some axis. And so I can see how pure the state is. And there's some. That, then you don't need to make this assumption. So you have the tomography, you, you don't have to submit. Let me, let, me, um, let me hold your question for a sec, because I think there's something more powerful than just doing the quantum state tomography. I'll, I'll point to that in a second. We're racking up the number of things I'll address for you. OK, so we're going to watch in time as they detect photons how the state evolves. OK, so we just see uh, one run of the experiment. I detected a sequence of photons, 6, 0, 3, 5, 4, 9. It's like a phone number. Um, and I watched how the state evolved, here showing in this arrow and the circle, as I detect those photons. And the idea is the information changing uh, my state of knowledge about where the ball is. So that's what I call the state. And this um, time evolution of this thing, this movie I just made, is what I call a quantum trajectory. So it's all those measurements, the effect they have on the state of the system. OK, so in the real experiment, I'm not measuring counting photons. I'm measuring uh, field quadrature of the electromagnetic field. So I'm measuring, if you think of it as a harmonic oscillator, I'm measuring the position of the field. So I get some noisy thing that's due to the quantum fluctuations. I can, for example, integrate that and get some average value. 
I compare that to what average value I get when I prepare the system in the excited state, some other average value, and I make the same histograms, repeating these many, many times, and I see, okay, this is what I get if it's in the ground state, this is what I get if it's in the excited state. And again, you see that the two distributions are overlapping, that I have poor signal to noise, but the signal to noise is fundamentally due to the quantum fluctuations of the light I'm using to probe the system. Okay, and so that's just these Gaussian distributions re reflect the fact that I have um, these two different phase shifts on this coherent state. Now, if we were concerned about the signal to noise being too bad, I could, for example, collect more photons. As you asked, why not just collect more of them? And I do that. I find that, okay, the, the variances of this decrease in time, and I get to a point where these two distributions are disjoint, and then I could tell with certainty, ah, look, it's on the top shelf, or ah, look, it's on the bottom shelf. And I don't have to think about this weak measurement thing, what's going on in between. Uh, but in the middle, I have some sort of uh, very weak measurement and some sort of partial measurement. And so I can be more quantitative about this measurement strength in terms of how what the signal to noise is, ranging between weak measurements and projective measurements. And I can actually write down a, a proper POVM operator that describes this measurement. Okay, so the measurement stems from the fact that we have a dispersive interaction between the qubit and the cavity that results in a frequency shift of the cavity depending on the state of the qubit uh, described by the sigma z poly operator. And so the measurement operator I write down for this is an exponential of the signal value I determined mi minus this, this sigma z poly operator. That's some, 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 some operator. And so each measurement I'm applying this operator corresponding to the measurement value v that I get, the density matrix. And this sort of formally updates the state, adjusting for the coherences and so forth in time. Getting the same answer we had from the Bayes rule, but much more formally. So if I take one of these signals here, where it's just a bunch of noisy uh, things, I can actually make a POVM operator, measurement operator for each one of those moments of digitization, this whole sequence of measurements, and then we're back to this kind of statement that I made before. We have a sequence of general measurements, and each point in time I update the density matrix state by applying the POVM operators on either side as such, and that gives me a new state. So this is how I formally update the state uh, described as a density matrix using these Krauss operators. Okay, so a single measurement trace leads to a single time evolution of the density matrix. And uh, shown here. And um, so I could take one of these noisy traces, I calculate what rho is a function of time, I'd express it trace of rho sigma x, trace of rho sigma y, trace of rho sigma z, I'm just expressing it in the terms of poly operators, and I see how the quantum state evolves in time. Note there's no projective measurements done here. Now if I want to confirm, and I don't think I showed it on, on the slide, that this prediction, say, at time t equals 0.3 microseconds is right, that the projection on the x-axis, uh, expectation of sigma x is 0.4, expectation of sigma z is 0.4, expectation of sigma y is 0.4, I can stop the experiment, and I could make a projective measurement of those different spin components and then do it again and again and again, what, get it, hoping that I get to the same condition here with each experiment. And I find that those averages do conform, conform to this prediction from a single trajectory. But the single trajectory allows me to, to update my state of knowledge without stopping and making a projective measurement. So in general here, it's in some, some current superposition of energy eigenstates, uh, but I'm tracking how that evolves with each according to these measurement operators. So that's hopefully answering questions. Why not do projective measurements? Projective measurements, experiments over, I'm done. This one I can track the quantum state without making projective measurements, with making these weak measurements. But you haven't told us how you know that the experiment measures this density. You're so, saying that it does. Um, you're saying that you right. have a correlation of an operator related to your voltage or your, uh, your, your signal and the sigma z, that's your m. Yeah. You so, know, let me. Uh, How do you know this operator updates the density matrix by this rule in the experiment? So, here's what How I do. You know so, the dense state of the system, what is, the, what is it for? It makes predictions for the outcomes of measurements I can make. Okay? So, at, say, a specific time, t equals 0.3, it's saying. I, I can believe you can measure enough about the system with some kind of tomography technique to. Uh, make the statement that rho k plus 1 is equal to this. Yeah. But there's no connection so far. You haven't told us how that was done, how, that, how, that, how you knew so much 
it went from one slide to the next, that rho k plus 1 is given by this updated rule. So I haven't, I haven't shown you why this is the rule, yeah? You didn't tell us why. Yeah. Well, you know that. so yeah, because you go and look this up in a, in a quantum, quantum physics textbook or something. I, I, um, no, no, I mean, this, is, yeah, this is an updating rule that's apparently completely arbitrary, and it's, uh, you, you're just writing it on the slide. Yeah, OK. Not, nothing we can do about that. So, but we can't understand it. Yeah. But you can, um, you'll have to trust me that I, you know, I can come up with all sorts of methods to take this signal here. In fact, I can write a machine learning thing that takes this noise and outputs some time evolution of a density matrix. And the question is, does that des density matrix make correct predictions for every possible measurement I can make on the system at any given point in time? And it does. Okay. So at each point in time, I can, I'll show you on the next slide here. Here's the dashed line is the single pr the projection from a single trajectory. And the solid lines are what I get from quantum state tomography at each point in time. And, and what I find is that you know, all of, a lot of the, okay, it's not perfect. There's experiments. There's only, I can only repeat so many times. But a lot of the bumps and wiggles, ups and downs and so forth, they're repeated in the tomography as they are for the single trajectory, which gives me confidence that really this is what the quantum state uh, stays doing. At least it's making the, all the right predictions. So I, as far as I'm concerned, it's just as good as, as any quantum state. The purpose of this slide was to say we can also drive the system while we're measuring it. So before we were thinking about just how the, what are the dynamics associated with the measurement. But we can also drive the qubit. And what does that do? It causes Rabi oscillations. Okay? And so now the, the evolution of states is, is forced to have an influence due to the quantum coherences. That is, when we're introducing a Rabi drive, um, the coherences are turned into populations. And the populations are turned into coherences. Um, and so the, the, the coherences start to affect the signal that we, of, that we measure. So the dynamics are, are, cannot, can't be alone described by this sort of Bayesian update anymore. Okay, so if you like, we can try to model this with a stochastic master equation. That seems to do well. We can apply those POVMs before. We can uh, break things down into different discrete chunks of time where we do a Bayesian update and we do some sort of rotation on the system. They all seem to give us uh, quantum states that evolve, that agree with the tomography that we can make at each, any, each point in time. Okay, so that's um, how we make quantum measurements. And what's fun about this is the idea, you know, in textbook quantum mechanics, they say, oh, you measure a quantum system, it collapses the wave function into one thing or the other. But now we've kind of slowed that process down. We're seeing uh, dynamics of the quantum state in the measurement process as we're measuring the, 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 the state of the spin. OK, so here's a, a fun uh, cartoon of our experiment, just to remind you what we're doing. Uh, we're going to start with some system and some initial thermal state. I'm plotting it on the block sphere, so it's not purely in the ground state. It has some initial temperature. Uh, we're going to make a projective measurement of that state as the first half of our two-point measurement uh, scheme. <clears throat> now the daemon is going to take that initial state. Daemon doesn't get access to the projective measurement. And the daemon is going to track the quantum evolution with the same sort of quantum trajectories I showed you before. So the quantum state evolves. And at some point in time, later, the daemon, knowing it's in nearly in the excited state, is going to make, apply a rotation to it to extract work from the system. So he's taking the quantum system from the excited state, which I put on the bottom of the block sphere, uh, and putting it in the ground state. So therefore, he's getting energy from it, getting work. Uh, then we'll make a second projective measurement to kind of quantify exactly how much work did the daemon get. And that's the protocol. So we'll repeat many times uh, to see what happens. And so from those measurements, we get uh, the work distribution. Okay? So if we focus our attention first on the red case, this is where the daemon doesn't do anything. We just let the system evolve. Um, what we see is that this shows the transition probabilities. So <clears throat> the probability that transitions from the ground state to the excited state, okay, so 450 50 times out of whatever 10,000 experiments, Sorry about that. Transitions from the ground to the excited state. There's also transitions from the ground to the ground, excited to excited. And there's relatively few transitions from the excited state to the ground state, simply because it starts off in a low temperature state. It's more likely to be in the ground state. Yes? Uh, sorry, I think I missed it. Yeah. So the feedback is, an, is so with, we what can apply Rabi drive that causes the system to rotate around. It's just one more drive on the system. 
Let me see if I can find that thing. So it's just the demon applies a pulse to it, resonant with the transition, and causing the state to, to rotate from the, the, it's a unitary rotation from the excited state to the ground state, or whatever state it is to the ground state. And you say, where's the energy? Okay, well, the demon applies a pulse. It's a classical drive with lots of photons in it. And when it transitions from the excited state to the ground state, what's happening is those photons stimulate an emission of one of those photons into the coherent drive. And so the drive comes out with more power than it went in. And that's where the work, useful work is extracted. But we're going to just measure that work in terms of how the energy of this, the qubit quantum system changed and infer that, OK, if the engineers have given, given access to this resource of energy really want it, they can design some sort of way to efficiently harness that and drive cars around. Turns out it's not very much energy, number, not much work. OK, so that's what we're quantifying here is just the changes in energy of the, the qubit. And that tells us what the work, the extracted work was. Okay. So if we look at the case with feedback, what you see is this distribution is shifted to the left. That is, the transitions from the excited to the ground are more likely than they were before. And transitions from the ground to the excited are less likely than they were before. And that's because the demon is extracting work some of the time. We can also look at just exactly what the demon did, because we could keep track of uh, what rotations the demon applies. And that gives rise to a continuous or somewhat continuous distribution of work that doesn't have to be just these prop, uh, does it, it doesn't, isn't quantized in units of energy quanta as given by the projective measurements, but is related to how much angle the demon was able to rotate it by. <coughs> okay, so the idea is the demon is cheating. It's using some sort of information about the quantum state to extract work. And so we expect the demon to break some rules. And those rules, that rule is the, is the second law of thermodynamics. And I'm going to present the second law to you as the Zharzinsky equality, which is a statement of the second law stated as an equality. It's a fluctuation, integral fluctuation theorem in some sense. So it says that the average of e to the beta exponential of the beta times the work, average over the work distribution, is equal to e to the to the beta times the change in free energy. So the free energy, if you remember, is the related to the ability of a system to do work. And um, if you would, like, in general, this uh, the, what we think of as the second law that the change in free energy is always less than or equal to the work done on the system uh, follows from this by the curvature of the exponential. So the Zharzinsky equality. The way to think about this is, is if I have some system that starts off in some initial thermal state um, and then I do some work to it. And it ends in some final state and then is able to re-equilibrate that state. And I want to know the change in free energy. Well, all I have to do is average over an ensemble of trajectories in which I did those work. So I think about the work done on it, and I average over some ensemble, I can get the change in free energy. It doesn't matter if that work is done uh, quasi-statically or what's going on. While we do this work, this equality still holds. So some people think this is just a trivial extension of what was known uh, before, of Crookes theorem, various things or a fancy way to say one equals one. Some people think it's a really powerful way to calculate equilibrium quanti quantities from non-equilibrium work. It depends on who you ask. But all the same, it's a, it's a statement of the second law. OK, so we're going to see how the demon does in terms of breaking this rule. So we'll use these projective measurements to quantify the work. And in our system, we expect the change in free energy to be 0, because the initial and final Hamiltonians of the system are the same. We're not changing that Hamiltonian. OK, so we actually expect that average over of the exponential of the work to be equal to 1. Okay, so we get all these transition probabilities. That allows us to think about what the work is. We do the experiment many times to get the average. And we find here's uh, that average. So it's not equal to 1. So the demon is breaking the second law, as we've stated it, uh, by about a factor of 2, almost. Okay, But that's no surprise, because the demon is cheating, and we didn't take into account the information the demon had. So one can go back and rewrite the second law as a generalized Zharzinsky equality with quantum measurement and feedback, uh, including this information, just like uh, C. Lard tried to do. Okay, and before the mutual information, we talked about information being quantified in terms of the mutual information. But we have to make a slight change here uh, to account for the fact that the system is not necessarily uh, diagonal in the energy basis. Okay, we can't, can't throw away something about the coherences. So what I'll do is, when I talk about these probabilities, the probability that's in the, so initially it's in the diagonal energy basis. So I can think about that as normal, um, in terms of like the normal Shannon, uh, Shannon entropy. 
But here, I'm going to think about the probabilities that occupies the states in the basis where the system is diagonal at the time of the feedback. So I'm going to diagonalize the system. It's always diagonal on some basis, and I'll think about the occupation probabilities in that diagonal basis. In some sense, I'm looking at the, the von Neumann entropy, something related to that. And so because it's not restricted to the mutual information, I'll call it the information exchange. OK, so now for each, each one of these experiments, we think about exactly what information the demon had when he made this feedback rotation to extract work. Okay, so we include that information in our calculation of the work distribution, or now this new quantity that includes the information. And we find that, ah, look, lo and behold, now we get something that's equal to 1. So the second law is saved when you take into account the information the demon had or the fact that the demon was cheating. We leveled the playing field. OK, so that's comforting that there's information. We understand what it is, and it makes us consistent with the second law. Uh, but this information exchange is actually interesting to think about on its own. So this information exchange is a, uh, some sort of a, a quantity that depends on two stochastic things, or several stochastic things. It depends on the probabilities that it occupies um, either one of the uh, eigenstates in the z and z prime basis, bases at the beginning and the end, and also depends on the individual trajectories. So if I average over the occupation probabilities in the z, z prime basis, or sum over that, I find the information exchange just along single trajectories. That's shown in uh, line, dashed lines here. So this dashed line shows one of those, one quantum trajectory, how the information is evolving in time. Okay? So and this depends on how the quantum state evolves and how the probabilities uh, evolve in that diagonal basis. The sort of green forest shows several hundred of the such experiments, showing you that each time it does something different, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. And the solid curve shows the average of all of those curves. Now, the first thing you might notice is that the information exchange, in this case, is negative on average. And that might be surprising if you know a lot about mutual information because the classical mutual information is always positive. This wasn't always obvious to me, but if you think back to a guessing game with cards, it's obvious that classical mutual information is always positive. So if we're back to the case where we have this, this shuffled deck of cards, so probably the top card is a two of clubs, one in 52. Again, if I look at the uh, bottom card, I can, up, I can have a better, I can sharpen my probability distribution to be one in 51, gain information. Now if someone else looks at a card, gets this peak at one of the inner cards in the deck, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't change my probabilities. The probability of the top card is a two of clubs is still one in 52. Okay, so I'm not going to lose information by someone else looking at the cards. This is even true if I stack the deck. So when I'm shuffling, I manage to get the two clubs right on the top because I'm very good at cheating at cards. Um, looking at the bottom card doesn't change my probabilities. Someone else looks at the card, again, it doesn't matter. So I can't lose information about the cards in the classical case. But if I think about quantum cards, I could imagine shuffling the deck such as the top card is an equal superposition of all the cards in the deck. So it's the 1 over the square root of 52 times 2 of clubs, 3 of clubs, 4 of clubs, so forth and so on. That was a much trickier situation because if someone else looks at a card in the deck and they find, say, it's a jack of hearts, well, that's going to change my superposition. It's going to partially collapse it, and I'm going to lose information about what that state is. Okay, so in the quantum case, someone else looking at the card actually matters to me and I can lose information. And that's exactly what's going on in, in our experiment. Um, the information we gather is, comes from the phase shift imparted by the, uh, on the microwave probe and the cavity. But that phase shift can be contaminated by different configurations of the detector. Effectively kind of adding noise to our, our signal so we just average over it here. But in reality, there was more information about what the phase shift was that we lost, that someone else had, the detector had, or something, some microscopic degree of freedom. And so I can think about my information exchange as the difference between two quantities that are positive definite. One's the information gain. It has to do with the total information gain possible. One's the information loss, which is the information that I gained uh, minus the information that was in principle possible to gain. Okay, so whenever the loss exceeds the gain, I get a negative informa information exchange. Uh, and whenever it's less than the gain, I get a positive information exchange. And we can see different regimes where these two different information loss, information gain, uh, play a role just by changing the initial temperature of the qubit. The initial temperature changes the initial purity. If the initial state is very pure, <coughs> that is very low temperature, 
then we can only really lose information about it because we already knew initially, the demon already knew exactly what the state was to start with. So it's very susceptible to loss. But if the initial state is very hot, very impure, then it's possible that the demon gains information and there's some transition um, between the two, which depends on the, the quantum efficiency that the demon's me measuring, how much loss uh, is susceptible to. Okay, so that's my story. I showed you that we um, were able to study this uh, generalization of the Zarzinski quality um, in this sort of regime of weak measurement and feedback, uh, thinking about the, the, how the demon's information can be used to salvage the second law. That allows us to think about this information dynamics along these single trajectories, seeing this information loss or gain. Um, and, and that's what we, what we find. Um, but I think that uh, to conclude the talk, I want to just inf reflect on um, maybe more broadly the question of what is information? Um, I gave this talk once and someone said, well, wait, what is information? Like, and I'm always confused about this too. It's mutual information. How do you know that we're defining the information correctly? Um, and I'd say the experiment gives us a chance to define what we mean by information. The information is what it takes to sit change to salvage the second law. Okay, and it turns out in our experiment that it's a change in von Neumann entropy. So we look through this experiment. Ah, the second law is violated. What does it take to patch it up? Well, we have to take into account some sort of information, and lo and behold, it's a quantity we're familiar with is the change of von Neumann entropy. And so maybe more broadly, the idea is that, uh, say we have some sort of quantum system, this demon is extracting work, and we're seeing work coming out of it, and we're trying to, to, to reconcile how that fits with thermodynamics, and that forces us to define information in this quantum way that takes into quantum coherences. So hope is that maybe in this sense, the quantum thermodynamics just tells us something fundamental about what information is. So with that, I'll uh, conclude my talk and take any questions you have. <laughs> OK, so suppose we describe everything uh, without breaking it up into the little subsystems of the qubits and then talked about the photons and the photon operator, and then there's the drive and the phase shift. So as we describe everything holistically as one larger system, then none of these paradoxes would happen. Am I right? So suppose we didn't break it into some we systems. We could move the entropy around for a closed system. Then none of these, these things would happen, yes. I think the total entropy will change for a closed system rather than a subsystem of a larger system. If the, the total closed system is evolving, then that, that total entropy would be fixed, it seems. And uh, none of this would happen, yeah. So, so the, the discussion and the magic happened because the system that we're looking at is exchanging entropy with the larger system. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, we're able to move that stuff around in apparent <coughs> violation of the second law, but not really because it's just a small, it's just a coupling of two systems happening in the experiment, which is useful because you understand. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think so. I agree with that. Yes, thank you. So, so on the measurement, I always have this, uh, you know, question. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, the, you described, for example, you know, in the, you know, you can measure the photon number, average photon number, so determine you know, in which state the qubit is in, right? Right. Okay, uh, I can somehow, you know, the saying, basically, this two, you know, distribution of the single photon state corresponding to different coherent state of photon. So in that case, I can say, you somehow entangle the ground state with one coherent state of alpha, and, you know, the, the other, you know, the excited state with another coherent state of beta. Yep. Okay, now if you write down this, if you treat this as a pure state, okay, then you have a zero alpha plus, you know, beta uh, plus one beta. Yep. However, this is different from, you say your qubit is in a zero and a one small position state, because if, if you do a, you know, the partial, you know, trace, you trace over the, you know, the photon degree of freedom, 
the attributed is always just in a mixture. There's no coherence in your, in your reduced density matrix. So, I so in that in that case, in how do I imagine, you know, say my photons in a uh, my qubit is still in a superposition state. <laughs> if I already entangled it with some pointer, right. in this case, it's like a coherent state. So, here's the. Um, Okay, so there's several things I want to say about your comment, which, it, which I think is getting at all the key points. So first thing that's important is, yes, we're taking our system, we're entangling it with our coherent states. And coherent states, as you know, are um, they're eigenstates of a non-Hermitian operator, so they're, they're not orthogonal. There's overlap between the two yeah. states, and that turns out to be important in this case. Um, OK, so we entangle it with the coherent state with our qubit, and then we measure the coherent state with our home, some sort of homodyne detector. And when we make that measurement, we're, we're collapsing that entanglement onto, we're collapsing that entanglement. So now we're, we're, we're collapsing it down to one thing. Now conditioned on the outcome of the detector, the qubit's in one state or the other. OK? Now if it's the, the interaction is very strong, like um, if we have two very orthogonal coherent states, that I can't distinguish between. Um, in that case, I'll, colla I'll collapse my system onto one state or the other. But if I have two current states that are, that are not particularly distinguishable, they're overlapping, then when I uh, measure the, the detected, project onto the, co the co coherent state basis, or pro make a projected measurement of that coherent state, and now I collapse the entanglement down, but the entanglement is no longer, that doesn't collapse the system onto one or the other, but to some other sort of superposition state of the two, two energy eigenstates. And so when, when the coherent state, when it's a weak measurement, as I, I'm constantly collapsing the entanglement with my detector, and I'm just projecting my quantum state into some different superposition state. If I make many of those measurements, yeah, eventually I collapse it into one or the other. The other thing you said is if I trace over this degree of freedom, that is I average over all my, if I forget about what my detector said, then yeah, I go to a mixed state. But the key here is I'm keeping track of what the detector says, that record. And so conditioned on those measurement records, I can actually maintain, in principle, a pure state evolution, although, albeit stochastic, it evolves uh, in, a, in a, I know exactly what it that's is. basic software in the quantum trajectory measurement. Yeah, that's the basis for the quantum trajectory measurement. Good question. Let's thank the speaker again.